from the Gospel of John, 145 A.D. A woman out of Samaria comes to draw out water. Jesus says to her, Give me something to drink. And so the woman, the Samaritan, says to him, How are you, a Jew, asking to drink from me? I am a woman, a Samaritan. Because Jews aren't having dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you had come to know the gift of God and the one who's saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked of him, and he would have given you living water. The woman says to him, Lord, you don't even have a pail, and the well is deep. So from where are you getting this living water? That was a reading from the Gospel of John, 140s A.D., We may rightfully question why exactly it is that the author of the Gospel of John feels the need to explain to his readers that Jews don't have any dealings with Samaritans. I mean, wouldn't they have already known this? I mean, who's he talking to? And now that line actually isn't in several of the manuscripts of John, I guess because like me, the scribes recognized how strange it was, but the best text critics all say that this line was originally part of the document. But there's an even bigger problem with this story about the rap battle between Jesus and the Samaritan woman, which goes on for paragraphs after this. And the whole story actually reminds me of that scene from Curb Your Enthusiasm, where Jeff Green gets into an argument with a nurse about whether good night nurse is an actual expression. And they just kind of go back and forth in single sentences for like five minutes. And Larry David is just looking at them like, what are you guys doing? But the problem that I mentioned is this. She says... How is it that a Jew is asking a Samaritan for water? In the statement that we're then given to explain this, that Jews don't have dealings with Samaritans, is strictly speaking incorrect. Because from the original author's perspective, the reason that the Samaritan woman is surprised is because she understands that a Jew would consider her pail, her water bucket, to be ritually impure. And as such, this would be the first document in history to make such a statement. And I want to say that the topic of Samaritans is one of the most richly rewarding when it comes to investigating the late origins of Christianity. And we don't have time to go into it here at the moment, but let it suffice to say that this view, that of Samaritans as a distinct sect associated in some way with impurity, is something that doesn't emerge in Judaism until at least the middle of the second century. Samaritans aren't in fact mentioned in the Old Testament, but they're alluded to in the kind of circumlocutory way that the Old Testament uh, writings are in the habit of using. Um, But we get the sense from them that Samaritans are a people who are ethnically and culturally similar to the inhabitants of Judea and share many of the same religious practices, but are nonetheless considered to be external to the culture and the society of the Old Testament writers and their audience. And if we were to go back to the early first century you know, to the supposed time of Jesus, if we had the opportunity to observe the Samaritans, we would conclude that they were in most ways a Jewish sect. But a lot changed after the destruction of the temple, 70 AD. And after that, the status of the Samaritans began to be reassessed. The historian Josephus, writing at the end of the first century, isn't yet opposed to Samaritans strictly on religious grounds. His problem with them is more political. He views them almost as like frenemies of the Jews, opportunists basically, who will turn on them if the opportunity comes up. But in the writings of the Talmud, especially in the tractate Kutim, and dating the Talmudic writings is always tricky, but in these writings, which preserve some second century traditions, we begin to see a view of the Samaritans that's similar to what we find in the Gospel of John, 
you know, there we're given a laundry list of what you can and can't buy from Samaritans, what you can and can't sell to Samaritans. They're annoyed at them for worshiping in the wrong place, just like the Gospel of John says. These are concerns about ritual purity as it relates to a schismatic group. The cooked and preserved vegetables of the Samaritans are forbidden, is one of the things they say. Now, the rabbis never outright say that the Samaritans are external to Judaism, but nonetheless, they advise to use caution when dealing with them, especially when it comes to religious matters. The split between the Samaritans and the Jews is more properly a split between the Samaritans and the Pharisaic incarnation of Judaism, the Judaism of the early rabbis, which is the same enemy of the early Christians in the New Testament documents. And because these trends within Judaism didn't arise until the second century, you know, the schism between the Jews and the Samaritans on religious grounds, what the Gospel of John is writing about, also dates to the second century. And it's not for nothing that we look closely for any links between Samaritans and early Christians. In fact, I think that to the extent that Christianity could be said to have originated in any one place, it would be in Samaria. And the Gospel of John preserves even a memory of that with Jesus's opponents accusing him of being a Samaritan and having a demon. And he only denies the part about having a demon, not being a Samaritan. So it's like that Nerf Herder joke from Empire Strikes Back where Han Solo only cares that she called him scruffy looking. Simon Magus with his salvation through grace by faith uh, just happens to be associated with Samaria. His disciple Menander who spread the rite of baptism also a Samaritan. Now, lastly, I want to say that the Gospel of John is one of the very few New Testament documents that mainstream scholars are willing to place in the second century. Like, it's not really a controversial statement to them. If you place this document in the 100s AD, they're just like, yeah, so what? And this is partially because the Gospel of John, they they look askance at it for some reason. Like, they treat it like an ex-girlfriend who cheated on them or something, I guess, because their consensus is that the synoptic gospels, that is Mark, Matthew, and Luke, are the ones that preserve the real information, the quote unquote real information about the historical Jesus. And John conflicts with them so much that they don't mind discounting its testimony and giving it a late date. But I will say that I guarantee you that if John was the last surviving gospel and we had lost those other three, then Christian scholars would still find a way to believe in historical Jesus. Only what they would do is they would read between the lines of the Gospel of John. Instead, you know, they'd be saying things like, I don't know, maybe there's some historical reality behind this 15 hour long speech that Jesus gives. But always remember that this story, this Samaritan woman at the well, this is a clear, almost an indisputable example of the second century author taking the controversies and the problems of his time and extrapolating them back into the first century at a time when it would have been completely anachronistic. And John is not the only one who does this. The synoptic gospels are full of this same kind of thing. And when you pull the thread of any individual story in those writings, the same way we just did here, you find that the whole fabric ultimately unravels and that these are found to be late and spurious texts. You're listening to Born in the Second Century, and the date is now January 10th, 2021. It was said by Simon Magus in the Clementine Recognitions, never invoke peace, invoke battle, which is the mother of peace, and if you can, exterminate errors. I'm your host, Chris Palmero, and the music for today's broadcast was provided by the recording group Pompey Gray. This is episode three, and I want to welcome everyone back. Now, I'm pleased with the positive reception this little program has had. This is only our third episode, but so far the response has been great. And you'll be happy to learn that we have guests from 10 different countries joining us, 10 nations where people are learning, possibly for the first time, that the traditional story of the beginnings of Christianity is nonsense. I want to point out, too, that as we go forward, we're going to be covering texts that you will probably never hear discussed in as great detail as we're going to do on this show. We're covering the New Testament now. But ultimately, to my knowledge, we'll also be the first to do full-length, multi-part episodes about the writings of Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, Minucius Felix, basically any second-century Christian or Jewish text you can imagine. And the, the, the pseudo-Clementine basic document, I would be stunned to find out that somebody did an episode on that. 
Um, the, this audience is going to be exposed to the real head stuff, the off-label Christianity that only the second century hipsters knew about, uh, the inscription of Aberkios, the sentences of Sextus, the gospel of the regions. And you might be thinking, you know, maybe there's a reason that podcasters don't talk about stuff like that because the texts are supposedly dry and boring like you would not believe. But what I'm going to show you when we cover them is that when you read these documents from a radical perspective, they're endlessly fascinating. I will say that it was about a decade ago that I first began to develop the theory that Christianity was born in the second century. And at that time, I was basing that on nothing more than a pretty decent familiarity with the Bible and with the anti-Nicene writings. But when I began to actually do a dedicated study of these books, I was stunned at the wealth of information that they provided to support that theory. And that's what I want to share. You know, not to say that there's not a lot of good, like radical content out there, things like the Bible Geek, Robert M. Price, others, and that goes without saying. And But I also listen to a lot of Christian podcasts, unfortunately. It's part of my research for this. And, you know, as much as they talk endlessly about the New Testament writings, they rarely delve into the more interesting aspects of the text. You know, as with pretty much anything that's done from a devotional standpoint, they squeeze out all the most interesting parts of the religion and the New Testament, like they're squeezing water out of a sponge. But we will cover that stuff on this show. And this won't be any superficial analysis either, because when it comes to this stuff, I'm like Bart Simpson when he took the focus in, basically. Um, by the way, you can email the show at secondcenturypodcast at gmail.com. Any feedback, ideas, questions. Uh, we also have a Facebook page, which I invite you to follow. It's facebook.com slash born in the second century, all one word. I'm posting announcements and some visuals there, some data graphs and timelines that I've been working on. Like I've also noticed too that I've been getting a lot of pushback from Christian apologists on there. But you know, at this stage in my life, I'm about 13 years into the deep study of this material. At this stage in my life, I'm not at all very interested in Christian apologists and arguing with them. If they want to rebut me, then what I recommend they do is do a counter podcast, which is like the exact same length as mine and responds to every single point that I bring up. And then I may or may not choose to listen to that and respond to it. But at the top of the show, I want to cover some feedback that I've received from the first two episodes. Uh, I have quite a few listeners asking when we're going to cover Christ mythicism and the historical Jesus. I'll just say off the top, like I did in episode one, that my system here pretty much excludes a historical Jesus. But I am going to cover that pretty extensively in future episodes, especially when we get to the Gospel of Mark, which is coming up soon. I I will say just briefly that a lot of the materials that scholars like Earl Doherty and Richard Carrier have written about um, does find a place in our theory, but not all of it. And in fact, I strongly disagree with them on certain issues like the historical Paul, uh, the nature and origin of the Odes of Solomon. Um, I disagree with really all their dates for the Christian writings. I think they put First Clement way too early, for example, like scandalously early, in fact, but... They're focusing, of course, on the historical Jesus, historicity of Jesus, but that's not my main focus. In fact, I think that even on the, hypo uh, the hypothesis of a minimal historical Jesus, you know, just a dude that was like some guy in Judea in 30 AD, you could actually still have Christianity originating in the second century. The only difference is that the legendary narratives about him in that case are based on some dude rather than being created out of whole cloth. And I mean, it's almost effectively the same thing, but the historical Jesus material is coming and a lot of it. Um, feedback on the subject of First Thessalonians, I received a letter asking me to explain why and how Christian scholars, conservative Christian scholars, assign a date to this writing. Um, I'm gonna give you right now a brief sample of the dates that different scholars have assigned to First Thessalonians. The editors of the Jewish Annotated New Testament give the earliest date that I found. They say that it could have been written as early as 41 AD, and that is mega early. In fact, I might write a letter to them myself asking them, like, what the hell's going on over there, basically. Uh, Harnack, one of the great Bible scholars of the 19th century, 47 to 54 AD. Bart Ehrman, friend of the show, uh, 49 AD. Now, 50 AD is where a lot of scholars seem to land. For example, we have Benjamin Bacon, uh, Richard Hurd, Ann Nyland. We have the editors of the Norton Critical Edition of Paul. And then we have a handful of others putting it a year or two later, Hugh Schoenfield and others. But for the most part, you don't really get that much variation from this 47 AD to 51 AD timeframe. Now, the question I'm answering is, how do they come up with those dates? 
And the short answer is that they're assuming that the letter was written by the historical Paul, whom they further assume is the very same Paul that's mentioned in the Acts of the Apostles. But first of all, the relationship between Acts of the Apostles and Paul's letters is a very tricky one because they don't match up exactly. Acts of the Apostles is kind of like the siren that calls out to Odysseus and his sailors because it's a book that seems to provide a straightforward chronology for early Christianity. But the key is to not be tempted into listening to it and accepting that chronology because it will lead you to your doom. But if you accept that Acts of the Apostles is a legitimate record of early Christianity in in some ways, as these scholars do, then it becomes a matter of assigning dates to the events that are recounted in that book. Now, 1 Thessalonians presents itself as being written shortly after Paul left Thessalonica, which is described in Acts chapter 16. Now, the closest datable event to this is the proconsulship of a man named Lucius Junius Gallio, the proconsul of Achaia, mentioned in Acts 18, and he served his term in office from about 51 to 52 AD. And there's also the death of Herod Agrippa, which is mentioned in Acts 12, and which we know to have occurred in 44 AD. Now, Acts places Paul in Achaia between these two dates, so he had to have written 1 Thessalonians between these two dates. And from there, it's a matter of kind of estimating the time frame for that based on what the author of Acts tells us about Paul's travels during this period. And I think it's a hopeless exercise because this cat is so bad at giving time frames for the events that he writes about that we have to conclude that he's trying to be deliberately obscure. But hopefully you can get a better understanding now about how these dates are assigned. It's guesswork based on cross-referencing Acts of the Apostles to other externally datable events. The dating of Christian documents in general, the way it's commonly done is, in my opinion, shameful. Generally, they tend to assume the earliest possible dates, like if they're given a range from 40 to 50 AD, they will always err on the side closer to 40 AD. And, And that's because the dating of these writings is wrapped up in apologetics. It just so happens that the earlier a date for a document, the more in line it is with this religious belief system that is based on these documents being early, close to the life of Jesus, and one that promises eternal life to its members. And in fact, Christianity in the modern world can be accurately described as a religion whose central belief is that 27 specific documents were written earlier rather than later. Uh, Or you could say a religion whose central belief is that 27 specific documents were written in the first century. Now, I myself place this letter at 105 AD. Since I remove Acts of the Apostles from the picture, I end up having to date Paul's letters relative to each other. And when doing that, there are two hard dates that have to be observed. At the right side of the timeline, the right-hand side, you have Marcion, the arch-heretic, the enemy of early mainstream Christianity, And he was active in at least the 140s AD, possibly the 130s, because Justin Martyr in the middle of the 150s can state that Marcion's beliefs and ideas have spread throughout the world. And it may be a slight exaggeration, but he's at least a known quantity at that point. Marcion was what we might anachronistically call the archbishop of Pauline Christianity in the mid-2nd century. I mentioned in the last episode that it's crucial to recognize that Paul's religion was fundamentally different from what we would define as mainstream Christianity. These two belief systems had entirely different origins and ended up being merged together after Marcion's time. Now, the left-hand side of the timeline in dating Paul's letters is the destruction of the Jerusalem temple in 70 AD. Now, always remember that Christianity presupposes the destruction of the temple. And I enthusiastically follow the scholar Thomas Whitaker in saying that this is a religion where sectarian Jews believe themselves to be in a transactional relationship with God, with no reference to cultic observances. And crucially, they do not feel the need to explain their religion as alternative to the temple cult. They do sometimes talk about sacrifices no longer being necessary, feast days no longer being necessary, circumcision. But in doing so, They're using the language of Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Isaiah. In other words, they make use of pre-existing counter-narratives already within Judaism. Not a single New Testament document ever references the temple cult as being both current and central 
to what it would consider mainstream Judaism. In that sense, you know, these documents are very much on the same plane as later Jewish writings like 4th Ezra or 2nd Baruch or even the earliest version of Revelation that also find themselves having to deal with what it means to be a Jew after the temple has been destroyed. And they do this by drawing on the stored wisdom of the diaspora literature or the apocalyptic to recast the idea of following the commandments of God as a transaction between the believer and God's intermediary, the celestial Messiah. So anytime that we have a document that can categorically be called Christian, it ipso facto must post-date 70 AD. Now, when it comes to assigning actual dates to Paul's letters within that range, we can see a spectrum of development throughout them. And in the earliest letters, Jesus is more of a fully spiritual entity. And the believers are a community that participates in his mystical death and resurrection. But as time goes by, the beliefs of mainstream Christianity, you know, the rival and enemy of Pauline Christianity start to infiltrate. You know, this is like the Christianity of Matthew that starts to come in. And by the end of Paul's letters, we find that Jesus has become an atoning victim, a vicarious sacrifice, something completely alien to the earlier beliefs of the church. And there are a lot of other similar ways to place the letters on the spectrum. Uh, their view of Torah, for example, the Jewish law. The earliest versions of the letters view the law as a guide, or as they call it, a child conductor that was necessary to lead us and guide us to the ultimate revelation of God in Christ Jesus. But in the later editions of the letters of Paul, we find that the law has now become a curse sent by God, the very cause of sin, which needs to be expiated by the death of Jesus. And 1 Thessalonians on that spectrum, in between those two hard dates, 70 and 140, falls closer to the earlier end than the later end. And it turns out also that this letter happens to be in very heavy dialogue with the second edition of 2 Corinthians, which itself is relatively early. 1 Thessalonians was either written by the same author as 2 Corinthians, or it was written within the same region, certainly by someone who had a similar belief system to that letter. And in this relative dating, I would place that edition of 2 Corinthians at about the turn of the second century, with 1 Thessalonians following uh, closely after that. You'll notice something else about 1 Thessalonians when it comes to dating. In this document, it's still an open question as to whether apostles are entitled to support from the church. The author here says that he could have asserted his so-called authority, but didn't. Um, now compare that with 1 Corinthians 9, which was clearly written much later, where the author just basically angrily demands that the church fork it over. And he says, Who at any time serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard and doesn't eat the fruit of it? Or who tends a flock and doesn't eat of the milk of the flock? That's 1 Corinthians 9. What a jerk, by the way. Uh, I would put that section of 1 Corinthians about 20 years later than the document that we're talking about today. And so when you leave the obvious signposts behind, you're left to muddle through with your dating as best you can, but that's really your only option in dating the Christian documents. If they don't mention external datable events like the letter of Barnabas kind of does, then you have to fall back on internal evidence and accounting, of course, for any additions and redactions. Today, we're going to continue our New Testament journey and complete our look at 1 Thessalonians, or as we might say if we were doing Bible study, we're going to be in 1 Thessalonians this week. We're going to continue to demonstrate that the writings of Paul are late, composite, and pseudonymous. These are really internal documents, internal books, to establish the legitimacy and the belief systems of the churches of Paul. They represent a totally separate religion from mainstream Christianity. As I always say, imagine something like the Sunni-Shia split within Islam, but in reverse. Like Paul's religion would definitely be the analog of the Shiite sect, and the mainstream Orthodox or Catholic Christianity would be the Sunnis. But instead of splitting from a common source, they originated separately and were merged together. Uh, history was rewritten to obscure the circumstances of that merging, and I don't mean to imply either that those were the two, uh, only two variations of Christianity in the second century. There were many others, which we'll encounter in the coming weeks and months. But today we want to show that the traditional way of reading this book, that it's a genuine letter from the hands of Paul himself, lovingly written and sent to a community of recent Christian converts, is not the best way to explain the problems and the questions raised by the book. And by the way, I just thought of something that pisses me off. <laughs> 
a, a lot of times what apologists will do when you point out that the style and the tone of Paul's letters vary between passages is they'll say, well, these letters were you know, sometimes written by Paul's secretary, like someone whom he designated to write the letter on his behalf. You know, and I'm like, okay, so like, then what? Did he not read these over before signing them? Or like, I thought he was supposed to be dictating them aloud. Like that's what it implies in Romans chapter 16. So like what kind of editorial process is going on here? And the other thing is, if you can beg the question of authenticity by appealing to an unknown secretary or an amanuensis, then how much of the doctrine in these letters can you really say actually originated in the mind of that guy as opposed to Paul himself? Because there are serious conflicts in these letters from one to the next. And this secretary explanation raises a hell of a lot more questions than it answers, but that's really neither here nor there at the moment. Now, what we should be asking throughout this, as always, is whether there's any compelling reason to believe the traditional origin story of this letter. If we can't find a compelling argument to believe that it's genuine and early, then we are free and clear to consider it spurious and late. See you on the other side. There used to be a structure in the modern city of Thessaloniki called the Vardar Gate. It was destroyed in 1876 AD. By the way, I don't say BCE or CE. I think Richard Carrier did a great piece on that. Basically for me, even if you say CE, you're still basing your calendar on the Christian calendar. So, But the Vardar Gate contained a Roman arch with an inscription containing the word Politarches, and this was the word for the administrators of the city of Thessalonica, which was awarded status as a self-governing city in return for supporting Octavian and Mark Antony in their civil war after the death of Caesar. The same word is used by the author of Acts to describe the city leaders of Thessalonica when he writes about them in chapter 17 of that book. And this inscription shows that that title existed in the second century as well, that's how the author of Acts knew about it. I wanted to bring that up here because that's one of the proofs that's usually submitted to the effect that the author of Acts was like this great historian writing in the first century, the fact that he mentions the Politarches. Now, the author could have been, and frankly, probably was, just some Schmegegi from Greece who happened to know that Thessalonica had its own administrators and what they were called. Thessalonica, in the time of the Politarches, uh, to which we now return, was one of the most important cities in this region in the second century. And it would go on to uh, be a major center of Orthodox Christianity under the so-called Byzantine Empire. And being a port city, it was a prime environment for the religion of Paul to spread. The Pauline Christianity spread very easily along trade routes and in major ports, kind of like venereal disease. You know, not that I'm necessarily comparing those two things. It's just an analogy. The great New Testament scholar Ferdinand Christian Bauer said the following about 1 Thessalonians, which immediately made him my personal hero. In the whole collection of the Pauline epistles, there is none so deficient in the character and substance of its materials as 1 Thessalonians. Just savage. I mean, he really hated this letter. Of course, he said it was inauthentic, and F.C. Bauer and his followers were the major opponents of traditional New Testament scholarship around the 1830s and a bit later, and in many ways, modern New Testament scholarship is still shaken by the experience of having to try and refute him. But these critics, uh, these early New Testament critics were absolute scorchers. You know, after the Enlightenment and the French Revolution, the first thing to fall by the wayside in New Testament scholarship was the belief that the scholar had to consider the documents to be divinely inspired. And once that was allowed to fall, these guys stormed the citadel. And they were brutal towards the New Testament books. I mean, you look at someone like Friedrich Schleiermacher, who can hardly be called a skeptic. Now, you may consider that, well, he wrote in the early 1800s, and so he probably pulled his punches because it was like a more conservative era. No, 
I mean, it's still worth reading today, although, you know, to some extent, the scholarship might be outdated. It's worth seeing the frontal assault that these guys were willing to make on the New Testament. And many of them felt that there was a true doctrine of Christianity that was possibly corrupted by the early church. And since they were now willing to drop the idea that the books were divinely inspired, the logical conclusion was that the authors of the documents themselves may have been partly responsible for the corruption of Christianity in the first place. So they went as far as they possibly could. But nowadays we live in very much a neoconservative era when it comes to the authenticity of the New Testament documents, whether they're viewed as historical or not. And scholars today seem to err on the side of assuming that the documents are historical or have some historical core. They view any kind of skepticism as having an agenda. It's a rather insidious belief and one which I dare say they would never apply to the religious writings of other cultures. And in many cases, they wouldn't even apply it to the Old Testament. On the subject of 1 Thessalonians, I said earlier in this episode that this letter was clearly written by someone who actually had 2 Corinthians open in front of them, or uh, 2 Corinthians, as some Bible scholars have liked to call it since 2016, or at least one of them called it that. And it's, it's not just that both documents are the only ones to name Paul and Silvanus and Timothy as the co-authors. They also share certain words that are used in either no other letter of Paul or no other book in the, Old, uh, in the New Testament. And here are some examples. Pleonecteo, meaning to take advantage, only used in these two letters. 2 Corinthians says, we took advantage of no one. 1 Thessalonians says, no one should take advantage of his brother. Epibareo, to be a burden, only used in these two letters. 1 Thessalonians says, I work night and day so as not to be a burden to you. 2 Corinthians says, I kept myself from being a burden to you. Mochthos, or toil, is only found in these two letters. 2 Corinthians says, in toil and hard work. 1 Thessalonians says, working night and day with toil and hardship. Both times the writer is referring to the apostles being the workers there. Dolos, or deceit, only found in these two letters. 2 Corinthians has Paul sarcastically saying, I took you in by deceit. 1 Thessalonians has him saying, our appeal was not based on deceit. Hope you're writing all these down. And there are other words like hapax as an adverb meaning once, only found here, 2 Corinthians and in a late section of Philippians. 1 Thessalonians and 2 Corinthians are the only two places in the entirety of Paul's letters where the word thlebo is used to mean persecution. And there are more examples. And this can't prove anything in and of itself, but uh, what each of these instances does show is that while these same objects and themes being written about are certainly covered in other documents, the fact that these two letters always choose the same unique word every time clearly shows that one was following the other. It would be much harder to explain how Paul could supposedly have written all the letters that appear under his name, but from letter to letter, in very specific cases, he forgets his usual expressions for certain concepts and certain ideas. There's also evidence to the effect that this letter was closely following 1 Corinthians also. Um, F.C. Bauer pointed out that where 1 Corinthians says, my word and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and power, 1 Thessalonians says, Our gospel didn't come to you in word only, but also in power and the Holy Spirit. Now, it's always possible to argue, as apologists do, that the wording in one or more passages might be similar simply because, of course, it's the same guy writing them. So, of course, he might say the same thing in similar wording, especially when he's writing to a different church. But we may rightfully question why exactly it is that some passages in these letters seem to be so close that they can only be explained as being intertextual, while in other passages and in other sections, the wording and the style varies so greatly that we can hardly conclude that the same writer wrote the passages in question. And that's, of course, when the apologists like to bring in the, the, the argument that the similar passages were written by Paul, but the ones that differ were written by his secretary and you know, talked about that already. Now we get back to our analysis of this letter with chapter three, and we still haven't gotten to the main point of the letter. The theme of chapter three is Paul explaining why he sent 
his sidekick Timothy to Thessalonica and didn't come himself. So why don't we talk about Timothy? His name means honoring God, which is quite a convenient name for a Christian apostle. It's kind of like the parents who name their kid Jeeves. And there's been some discussion by apologists that Christians may have changed their name or adopted new names after baptism, but there's hardly any evidence of that from these texts. And these are the same people who say that we can only work off of what's in these texts. But Paul in this letter, and remember Timothy is supposedly one of the co-authors of this letter as he is of 2 Corinthians Paul in this letter refers to Timothy as our brother and fellow worker of God. That's in all the best manuscripts, as they say, but some copies of this letter have him saying our brother and minister of God. Others have him saying our minister of God and fellow worker. Now, I bet you wouldn't have guessed that Timothy, this complete non-entity, ends up being extremely important for demonstrating the late origins of Christianity. So now I'm going to tell you everything that Paul's letters say about Timothy, but for now, I'm going to leave out the two letters that are supposed to be addressed to him. Um, In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul tells the Corinthian church to be imitators of him. And then he immediately says, For this reason I've sent you Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, and he'll remind you of my ways which are in Christ, just as I teach everywhere in every church. We are told nothing else about Timothy here or why he had this exalted position at Paul's side. Then a later editor of 1 Corinthians comes in at the end, chapter 16, refers back to that passage. He says, If Timothy comes, see that he's with you without cause for fear. Incidentally, this is one of the ways that you can tell that 1 Corinthians had more than one author, because the earlier author said, I'm sending you Timothy, and the later author is in fact not so sure that he actually sent Timothy. Like, maybe he didn't understand what chapter 4 said, He's the co-author of 2 Corinthians, which inspired the letter that we're talking about today. Here, he's said in chapter 1 to be one of the founders of the church in Corinth, along with Paul and Silvanus. But he is not mentioned again for the entirety of 2 Corinthians. In fact, to the extent that Paul has a sidekick in 2 Corinthians, it's actually Titus. Titus is called my brother, my partner. The author talks about him in almost the exact same terms in which Paul talked about Timothy back in 1 Corinthians. Timothy is also the co-author of Colossians and Philemon. And and these two letters, which even biblical scholars question, were written by the historical Paul, but they don't mention Timothy in any other place other than the superscription. Now, scholars tend to question the authorship of Colossians, but usually not Philemon. But the problem is that those two letters are more or less intertwined. You know, the authenticity of one should stand or fall with the other. Really, they just don't want to lose Philemon. It's like a pride thing because... It's such a short letter. They feel like it should be an easy battle for them to retain it. In Philippians, Timothy is also the co-author, and the author makes the amazing statement, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, in almost the exact wording that he used in 1 Corinthians. Philippians is a late document, even by the standards of the letters of Paul. Timothy is also mentioned briefly in Romans 16, the end of the letter to the Romans, which even Christians have debated about for nearly two millennia now, uh, whether that part of the letter is original or not. And there it says that he greets the recipients. Now, every document that I've just mentioned, with the possible exception of Colossians, is maintained by nearly all biblical scholars to be an authentic letter of Paul. So to them, this is all firsthand information that we're getting about Timothy. I now ask you, I just read the entirety of the information that we get about Timothy in Paul's so-called authentic letters. What would you be able to tell me about Timothy based on what I've just read? And you can obviously see the passages for yourself. I didn't leave anything out of that testimony. What are Timothy's beliefs, for example? What's he like? What are some of his characteristics? Now, if we could sum it up, we might say that Timothy is basically just Paul's avatar. He's like an enforcer that Paul sends out to do his bidding. In short, Timothy is portrayed as an apostle of Paul. What we're dealing with here is myth-making from within the Pauline community. You know, Paul and Timothy are like Batman and Robin, or Paul is like Mozart, and you know, Timothy is like Mozart's friend or something. I mean, there appears to have been a tradition within Pauline Christianity that the legendary Paul went about with some super friend companions, and Timothy was one of them, Silvanus was another. Timothy was believed to have had a hand in founding the Corinthian church, but he does nothing. 
says nothing. I mean, what are his beliefs? He's a cipher. He's like the Armitage character from Neuromancer. Like he's nothing more than a frame from which to hang the character of a companion and apostle of Paul because as with any legendary founder, the founder needs disciples. The founder is perceived as being the head of a sort of school. He needs loyal students and followers, learners. We see this too with Stoicism and other belief systems. The lack of information that we get about Timothy is a singular indicator of his not being historical. But someone might argue, well, you could make the opposite argument about Paul. The letters give us a lot of information about Paul. They certainly show his personality. They provide some biographical information. But the fact is the letters provide too much information about Paul, too much contradictory information. It's like an embarrassment of riches. And it's clear that we're dealing with something there that's more akin to the example of Jesus, where competing schools, competing clerics are taking up this personality and ascribing their own preferred traits to it. They're doing that out of a concern of, of, of authority and orthodoxy, but their depiction of Timothy serves quite a different purpose. It's more to flesh out the legend of Paul because a great teacher needs disciples and their church needs more legendary heroes. This is the reverse Sunni-Shia split. The religion of the Pauline church was a competitor of Christianity, and as such, it needs its own Peter, its own James and John, its own Andrew, you know, most of those characters hardly even get a backstory until it's time to write the apocryphal Acts. And Timothy himself doesn't get a backstory until it's time to write the pastoral letters and the Acts of the Apostles. And both of those conflict. I mean, the author of the pastorals thinks that Timothy is third generation Christian, but the author of Acts states that his father was a pagan, his mother was Jewish, albeit a believing Christian, but it's outright stated in Acts that he's a second generation Christian and not third generation, as the pastorals say. So those two writers were trying to develop the legend in their own way. St. Gordy said about Timothy that this was a historical person who was a Jewish Gnostic, and there were legends in the Pauline church associated with him. And the good St. Gordy also thought that Timothy was a historical person and actually wrote Second Corinthians. I'm not sure what the good St. Gordy was thinking there, a rare lapse of judgment on his part, but he pointed out that as the Pauline church in the second century drifted towards Catholicism, the references to Timothy slowly begin to disappear. They are replaced with a new person, Titus, a companion of Paul who is more appropriately Catholic, actually more of a blank slate, you know, a more malleable character, a more acceptably orthodox one without the baggage of the association with Gnosticism that Timothy had being linked to the origins and the founding of the Pauline church. And it's notable that this attempt by the pro-Catholic party in the Pauline church to advance the counter legend of Titus as a substitute for Timothy wasn't the only effort to rewrite the early history of Paul and his companions because the book of Acts doesn't mention Titus at all. The author of Acts may not even have been aware that there was ever a person called Titus mentioned in Paul's letter. Um, what that author does to sanitize the early history of Paul and his companions is that he plays fast and loose with the superhero origin story of Timothy. You know, Timothy's given a proper Orthodox background. He's strictly tied to Judaism via his mother, which is in the interest of the author of Acts. He wants to sever Timothy as far as possible from association with Gnosticism and the early Pauline church. In fact, the author says that Timothy agreed to be circumcised by Paul in order to be more acceptable to the, quote, Jews who were in those parts. And how often in Paul's letters do we see Paul absolutely raging against circumcision, the circumcision which was the practice of the early mainstream Christianity, the branch that claimed a more direct lineage from Judaism. And this characterization of Timothy by the author of Acts, this rewriting of the Timothy legend was done to neuter this mythical hero of the Pauline church and the Pauline Gnosticism. But we've also seen here that Timothy himself was most likely a legend developed by the Pauline church of an earlier period. I see no reason to regard Timothy in any of his instantiations as anything more than a merely literary creation. And I also might say something here in connection with the historicity of Paul. And the furthest I would go on the hypothesis of a historical Paul is to accept an utterly minimal historical Paul. In other words, there was possibly a guy who either was known or became known as Paul, who may have been a Simonian or Syrian missionary in the 50s or 60s or 70s AD. It's essentially, this is a variation of von Manen's hypothesis, but 
I would go no further than that. It's similar to the minimal historical Jesus hypothesis where Jesus was basically some dude in the time of Pontius Pilate. But whereas I absolutely don't accept that view of Jesus, I find that there aren't too many issues with accepting it for Paul. Um, and, you know, even Richard Carrier and others said that, but I absolutely don't accept the historicity of Timothy. We'll talk much more about that fool when we get to the uh, episodes about First, Second Timothy and Titus. But when I started this project, I had no idea how important Timothy would be to the process of delegitimizing the time-honored New Testament narrative. And it turns out that Timothy is one of the threads that if you pull him, it, it, it unravels the entire operation. Lastly, I'll note in passing that the end of 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 contains what appears to be the intended ending of the letter. And the writer says, Now may our God and Father himself and Jesus our Lord direct our way to you, and may the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another and for all people, just as we also for you, so that he may establish your hearts without blame in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. I said in the last episode that some scholars divide this letter into two separate documents, letter A and letter B. That's the theory of Walter Schmithals, and this is usually given as the end of letter B. I already discussed my own opinion of that theory, but one alternate explanation for this weird line would be that two people worked on this document, kind of like Google documents, basically. Um, and when you look at uh, reconstructions of letter A and B, you find that this part, letter B, uh, contains a lot of the information about the setting and the circumstances of the letter. Now, the writer of this section may have back actually been like a professional writer, like a contractor, or maybe even a Pauline Christian who had had some rhetorical training, was kind of brought in to establish the scene and the tone, kind of set the mood for the letter. And the main writer who wrote the doctrinal sections added in his own material around that. And this section, which sounds like a closing, may have been how this secondary writer signed off on his portion. And the editor liked it so much that he kept it, no matter how awkward it sounds in the final product. Now, when we come back, we'll look at the last section of the letter, including the infamous rapture. get to chapter four and here it comes. For we are saying this to you in a word of the Lord, that we, the living, the ones being left in the time of the presence of the Lord, will not precede those who fell asleep. Because the Lord himself, in a loud directive, in the voice of an archangel and the trumpet of God, will descend from heaven and the dead in Christ will stand up first. After that, we, the living, the ones left, simultaneously along with them, will be snatched in clouds to a meeting of the Lord in the air. And this is how we will always be with the Lord. So exhort one another with these words. But about the times and the seasons, brothers, you don't need anything to be written to you. For you yourselves have come to know precisely that the day of the Lord is coming in the manner of a thief in the night. Because whenever they might be saying, peace and security, then a sudden ruin is standing over them, even as labor pangs to the woman with child, and they might never flee from it. The Old Testament book of Joel describes the day of the Lord, heralded by a trumpet, a day of darkness and gloom. The author says there's never been anything like it, nor will there be again for many generations. A fire consumes before them, Behind them a flame devours. The author understands this day as God bringing vengeance on behalf of his people of Israel and judging the nations. From its earliest days, the Pauline church believed that Christ Jesus would come to earth at the end of time. And this document from about the midpoint of the history of the religion of Paul shows that they had come to believe it would be a day of universal judgment. The Jewish document, 4th Ezra, which was written about 10 years before this, 
also describes the end of the world and the coming of the Messiah in judgment and vengeance. It says, They shall see the men who are taken up, who from their birth have not tasted death, and the heart of the earth's inhabitants shall be changed and converted to a different spirit. When you compare this passage from 4th Ezra to what we read here in 1st Thessalonians, we see these are two competing Jewish traditions struggling with the same concept. We expect a judgment, we know the Messiah is coming, and we want to know specifically what that looks like on a practical level. So this is more myth-making. 4th Ezra, when talking about those who haven't tasted death, is probably talking about the virtuous figures from the Old Testament like Enoch, who were said never to die. In the Pauline Church, the holy ones, the saints, are those who have died and have risen in Christ Jesus and are now essentially members of him, sharers in him. The fundamental belief of the Pauline Church was, when it was originally founded was that uh, baptism was a mystical death and resurrection in the spirit, almost exactly as in the mystery religions, the cults of Attis and Osiris, that had such a great impact on the Pauline church and the religion. And the earliest section of the letter to the Romans, written by a Gnostic Christian, says, If we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. This is a mystery God, and the question is, once this religion has been ongoing for 10, 20, 30 years, and people in the church start literally dying off, then the question becomes, well, what about them? I mean, we were essentially supposed to cheat death with these mystical sacraments. And we get the answer here. And don't be fooled by the flowery language here, the highfalutin Septuagint references. What we're reading here is a piece of theological hair splitting. It's no different in spirit than what we might find the medieval universities churning out in the scholastic era Uh, This section here would appear on its face to be the biggest obstacle to a second century origin for this letter or a second century origin for Christianity because it appears literally from what we're reading that Paul himself in the first generation of Christianity is answering concerns from members of that first generation to the effect that they're upset that some of their fellow converts have died. But when we read it carefully, we find that this is nothing more than the logic chopping of a theologian speaking from the relative peace of a writing desk, one or even two or three generations removed from the original activity of the missionaries who founded this faith. And this passage of 1 Thessalonians, which looms so large in the modern church, you know, at least in the United States with uh, the rapture and the left behind books and everything else, is found to be nothing more than a theological commentary on the passage from 1 Corinthians that was written nearly 20 years earlier and which this author has in front of him. We need to go back to that passage now. And that author says, 1 Corinthians 15, Behold, I'm telling you a mystery. We won't all fall asleep, but we will all be changed. In an instant, the blink of an eye, in the last trumpet, for it will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we will be changed because it's necessary for this corruptible thing to dress itself with incorruptibility and this mortal thing to dress itself with immortality. But when this corruptible thing dresses itself with incorruptibility and when this mortal thing dresses itself with immortality, then the word, the word written down, will come to be. Death has been drunk down to victory. The writer says that we, the adherents of the Pauline religion, the adherents of Chad Strianity will be raised in a spiritual body, a pneumatic body, because flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. This passage of 1 Corinthians is proof that the beliefs of the early Pauline church differed from mainstream Christianity. The mainstream Christian belief was that because Jesus was raised in a flesh and blood body, then so too will the Christian believers be raised in a flesh and blood body. This belief was not shared by the Gnostics, and it was not shared by the churches of Paul. It wasn't even shared by the churches of Paul in the 150s AD when Marcion was in charge. Their belief is reflected in passages like this from 1 Corinthians and in similar passages like 2 Corinthians 5. And now the practice in the Christian church, as it has been for centuries, is to harmonize this to view this passage as saying that when Christians rise from the dead, that it's not their corrupt mortal flesh that rises, but they're given a flesh and blood body of a heavenly nature. And they present this passage as Paul specifically uh, 
refuting heretics who disbelieved in the resurrection of the body. And Tertullian was the first to really set the tone for this. He wrote about this very uh, issue in his book, On the Resurrection of the Flesh. The Christian mercenary writer Athenagoras, about 30 years before that, was already saying that the body of the resurrection was reconstituted from its constituent elements, its dissolved elements, and made anew. And this is an orthodox belief, a Catholic belief. It was not the belief of the Pauline religion. You know, even though Athenagoras and Tertullian, for that matter, quote 1 Corinthians 15 to make their case, if this was the belief of the Pauline church from the beginning, then why in 1 Thessalonians would the author feel the need to address the question of people who had already died? I mean, if these people were following the mainstream Christian belief, which was that the dead Christians would simply rise from their graves and be gifted with a magical flesh and blood body, why would the author of this letter feel the need to speak to the doctrinal concern that he does? He, you know, he could have just said like, yeah, dummies, they rise from the dead and get their fancy new bodies. Like, don't you remember what Jesus said to the Sadducees? Remember that the author of 1 Thessalonians says that he's giving us this information because according to him, he doesn't want us to be ignorant about the people who have already died. And he doesn't want us to be grieved like the people who don't have hope. He then essentially says that the same spiritual resurrection, you know, the same gift of the pneumatic body that the Pauline church believes in will be granted to the risen dead. It is a theological clarification and nothing more. And further proof of this is the fact that he does something which is relatively rare in Paul's letters. He has Paul speak ex cathedra from the mouth of Jesus himself. He's making a definitive statement as an inspired prophet in the name of God. We tell you by the word of the Lord. It's really no different from what theologians like Irenaeus or Hippolytus would be doing decades later, clarifying questions of belief and doctrine, but where they appeal to the scriptures this writer appeals to God himself, speaking through the name of the legendary founder of the church. This passage about the rapture is possibly the only passage in this entire letter that might give us pause if we try to place it in the second century, but by not being deceived by the poetic language and by viewing it as the commentary that it is, we understand its context more fully and regard the passage as being really timeless, and by that I mean it's, it's not responding to a pressing question that some Thessalonian doofus had, but rather it's the priesthood of the developing religion of Paul commenting on its own prior texts. And we're still at such an early date in the church that this particular writer can feel bold enough to issue an announcement in the name of Paul and actually of Jesus himself or maybe God himself because the Lord doesn't always imply Jesus in these texts. It could just as well indicate God as I think it actually does here. Now, the day of the Lord is also mentioned in books like Amos and Zephaniah, and the author also references Daniel here when he talks about the times and the seasons. You know, you don't know the times and the seasons when the day of the Lord will actually come. And this is another important point for the dating of the document. A lot of times, scholars and even some more radical scholars tend to date Christian documents based on the idea of belief in an imminent parousia. That is, in what they see as the earlier Christian documents, the writers are still laboring under the belief that Jesus will come in their own lifetime. And then with later and later documents, you start seeing them back away from this belief. And the, the scholars think, therefore, that a document like 1 Thessalonians, which believes Jesus will come in the near future, indicates that the document is early. Like here, the author himself seems like he expects to still be alive when Jesus comes. And then documents where they're kind of like, oh, well, who the hell knows when Jesus is coming back? Just be ready. They say that those documents are later. But I'm going to tell you now about a Christian document called the Epistula Apostolorum, the Epistle of the Apostles. It was written in the mid-2nd century. It is pseudonymous. Hardly anyone ever talks about it. But that document states in no uncertain terms that Jesus will come to earth and the end of the world will come 150 years after the resurrection of Jesus. And this is a 2nd century text, indisputably so, and it's saying that Jesus is going to come in the reader's lifetimes. I mean, in fact, in 2012, I remember seeing on the DC Metro all these signs and placards to the effect that, you know, the day of the Lord was coming in May of that year, which is what some local cult believed. We can't use the time frame of the parousia of Jesus as a reliable method to date these texts without first examining the thought world of the particular document that we're looking at. Uh, and, the, and the thought world of 1 Thessalonians is that this writer— 
probably the same writer who composed at least part of 2 Corinthians, is sitting comfortably in his little Hellenistic office cubicle, and he's churning out esoteric commentary on 1 Corinthians 15, trying to gain clout within the Pauline church. I mean, he's a poster, basically. I mean, the people he's writing to were not the first generation of Thessalonian Christians who were scared for their salvation because they noticed that their neighbors kept dying off. I mean, if that were the case, we would most likely have no record of the conversation that transpired. But because this is fundamentally a theological passage, it does not answer immediate worldly concerns. Now, before we move on here, I will note in passing that this section here, along with the letter of Jude, are the only two passages in the New Testament that mention there being such a creature as an archangel. Archangels were highly important beings within Jewish Gnosticism, which the letter of Jude is in heavy dialogue with. So we can notch another point towards this community uh, being closer to Gnosticism than to mainstream Christianity. And it should also be pointed out here, as Robert M. Price notes, that the author doesn't specifically distinguish the voice of the Lord from that of the archangel. So in the author's mind, the Lord could very well be identified as an archangel here. There's a scene in the movie, The Truman Show, where Truman is having an argument with his wife and she stops in the middle of it to start reading ad copy. It's how the 24-7 show runs its commercials. And when she does this, Truman looks around confused and he says, who are you talking to? And there's a lot of moments like this in Paul's letters where the author takes this retrospective tone sounding desperately like he's trying not to break the fourth wall, but he's telling the audience things that they reasonably already know. F.C. Bauer pointed this out about 1 Thessalonians. He said, the chief part of the epistle is nothing but a lengthy version of the history of the conversion of the Thessalonians as we know it from the Acts. It contains nothing that the Thessalonians wouldn't know already. I would disagree with him where he says that the historical material in this letter is drawn from Acts of the Apostles, but the point remains. Now, it could and has been argued that this practice of telling the reader what they already know was part of standard oratorical style, but to me, that just further cements the idea that these documents were primarily literary creations, and the fact that they were using certain style conventions doesn't therefore mean that it was a first-century letter. It could just as well have been written in the second century and used those same conventions. And that should go without saying. But in chapter five, we also get another example of a trend in a lot of Christian writings that are posing as ostensible letters, which I call the keep doing what you're doing section. And in this, the author wants to give a general exhortation and encouragement. Like he wants to say something like, don't be lazy, for example. But he's afraid that if he writes it that way, then the reader will then assume that the Thessalonians were lazy. And that would completely compromise what he's trying to do which is not only to convey the information that's actually in the letter, but to also sort of big up the Thessalonian church. So the way he'll frame it is to say something like, don't be lazy just as I know you won't be. You know, like, I'm sure you're not doing that, but just don't do it anyway. And 1 Thessalonians 5 contains the line, encourage one another and build up one another just as you are doing, which is a good example of this. You know, here, this would be very out of place if we were recipients of the letter ourselves. Like, we'd be thinking like, Why would he have just said to build one another up? Like, does he assume that we're not doing that? But really, it's an exhortation delivered to Christians everywhere. You know, at this time, the Pauline church hadn't yet developed the technology that would come in so handy later, which is to edit its letters to make them general and cyclicals. And they did this with 1 Corinthians, and someone changed the greeting so that it became addressed to all Pauline Christians everywhere. Finally, with the letter to the Ephesians, they just gave up on this entirely and addressed the letter to like the entire world, basically. 
But this chapter is just a laundry list of exhortations. Some of them are quite important, and we'll cover them when we get to do a close reading of the letter. I want to highlight a few things. We can see that this letter, for example, is earlier than the letter to the Ephesians, because in that letter, he gives probably the most famous line from all of Paul's letters, from Ephesians 6. You know, our struggle is not with flesh and blood, and it it describes putting on spiritual armor and equipment. But we see a a kind of test run for that line here. The author tells the readers to put on the breastplate of love and faith and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. And this is kind of a mishmash of concepts from the book of Isaiah, chapter 59. Again, going back to what we talked about in the last episode, he's essentially lifting concepts from the Jewish scriptures for poetic metaphors and to ground some of the concepts, but he's reluctant to quote the Old Testament outright. I've been, I've been reading recently that it's the opinion of most Christian scholars that this letter is notable because it makes little use of the Old Testament. But in fact, it makes relatively heavy use of the Old Testament. It's just that the author kind of raids it for metaphor materials, kind of like an extraction mission, like we talked about last time. His community is in some way close to Judaism, but they would be unwilling or unable to consider themselves actual Jews in the sense that that would have had in maybe the mid-2nd century And at this point, they consider themselves a Jewish sect at best, or something that in their mind is probably beyond Judaism or superseding it. Then we get this. The author says, Don't quench the spirit. Don't despise prophetic utterances, but examine everything. Hold fast to what is good. Some of you from a more conservative Christian background may be deeply familiar with this line, They like to quote it all the time, especially in churches where they believe in charismatic ecstasy still. But what this shows is that the Pauline church believed in prophetic gifts of what it called the spirit. And the earlier we go into the history of the Pauline church, the more pronounced this belief actually is. A handy way to assign dates to Paul's letters, or at least sections of the letters, is to examine what they say about prophetic speech. Now, the earlier you go, the more democratic the view tends to be, like, Anyone can be possessed by the spirit and just start babbling some shit, you know, kind of like what we would see in the heresy of Montanism somewhat later. But the further along you go in the future, you know, the more they try to set ground rules and kind of regulate this activity. And here they're at about the midpoint, which agrees well with my date of 105 AD for this letter. He says not to fully discount prophetic speech, but, you know, think about what the prophet is saying, kind of turn it over in your mind And if it's good, meaning if it comports well with the commonly accepted belief, then go ahead and take it seriously. Now, a later author came in and added a comment here when he says, hold fast to that which is good. And this echoes a comment that was attributed a lot to Jesus in the second and the third century where he said, uh, be skilled money changers, rejecting some things, but holding fast that which is good. You know, this, this Jesus quote comes up in second and third century sources about eight times. It's part of what's called the agrafa, or the unwritten sayings of Jesus that show up a lot in apocryphal sources. And it's usually unattached, meaning that it appears in a list of supposed sayings of Jesus, you know, not in connection with any story. And as far as we can tell, it probably referred to charismatic prophecy. Remember that most of the early Christian groups spread through the activity of inspired prophets. These would go from town to town, essentially go into a trance and babble and give sayings of the Lord and other commandments. And one of the main things to remember is that we don't know just how much of the early Christian writings and uh, early Christian beliefs, in fact, actually had their origin in something that these maniacs said while they were in a trance. I mean, even if you read Jewish books like The Ascension of Isaiah and the Second Baruch, you find evidence that prophets in this time period, you know, the turn of the second century, would commonly see visions in a trance-like state. And I think it's actually in 2nd Baruch where God instructs the prophet to go to a field and starve himself for a few days. And after that, only eat certain flowers. And then God will visit him again. It's clearly instructions on how to enter a hallucinogenic trance. This kind of thing was instrumental to the spread of early Christianity. Again, how many words of Jesus, how many stories of Jesus... How many of the individual beliefs that we see recounted in Paul's letters, how many of these things originated in the minds of some dudes who were essentially tripping? I hesitate 
to attribute all or most of the early Christian beliefs to this source because one of the guys who translated the Dead Sea Scrolls essentially ruined his career by pursuing that theory. But what I will say is that some of the things that these prophets were saying did make their way into Christian belief, but some of it was a bit too weird even for the more freewheeling churches. And that's why the writer of 1 Thessalonians tries to lay down the law here and at least begin to set some rules governing this trance speak in the churches. A later Christian author appears to recognize that that related to what he saw as a saying of Jesus about holding fast to what is good. And he added that, that, that phrase there as a comment, probably at first in the margin of the page, but over time it drifted into the main body of the letter, or probably at the, the very first time it was copied again. Now, incidentally, the line in 1 Thessalonians that's right after this, keep distant from the sight of any wicked thing, is the very first line from 1 Thessalonians that is ever quoted by an external source, that being the letter of Polycarp, which I would place in the 170s. The more conservative Christian scholars place it in the 110s, and the less conservative ones like to place it in the 140s. The radicals place it after 160, usually. But be that as it may, this is the first time that we ever see 1 Thessalonians being quoted by any other source. The letter ends with the following statement. I adjure you in the Lord for the letter to be read aloud to all the brothers. The word he uses for read aloud, by the way, is one of those special words that's only found here and in 2 Corinthians and in like one or two really late sections of other letters. But this sentence has been the subject of a lot of debate between radicals and conservatives. And Robert M. Price follows F.C. Bauer when he says that the real agenda here is to seek inclusion of this spurious letter among the corpus of the real ones in the public lection of the churches at a time when they've come to be treated as scripture. And he says, you know, Treat this like the authentic Pauline letters, okay? And I think that's correct. And keep in mind that these writings were not intended to be read to impressionable congregations of early Christians in their house churches, kind of sitting around in their pajamas with hot cocoa. You know, these are clerical writings. Again, don't let their informal tone fool you. They're transforming the genre of the parenical letter into a vehicle for the beliefs and the doctrinal views of their own power group within the church. And so the instruction to read the letter aloud in the churches is more or less a statement to the effect that the writing is to be perceived as authoritative. And we can therefore speculate, you know, given the fact that the author felt the need to add this line to the letter, as to whether there might have been a power struggle going on in the church in his time. And I don't agree with Robert Price on the specific statement that this line was added to give the letter legitimacy so that it could be entered into the collection of Paul's letters. But I think that specifically at this time, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, and maybe an early version of Romans, were the only letters floating around. And the author was actually trying to say, put this letter on a par with those other three. And there's a fine distinction between those two ideas. And with this, we've completed our overview of 1st Thessalonians. I chose to focus today on major themes. So we talked a lot, for example, about the legend of Timothy as the super friend hero of the Pauline church and the Catholic counter legend of Titus. And these are the kind of themes that are going to be coming up again and again when examining these texts and looking for that odd phrase, that out of place word, that sentence that seems like it makes sense. But when you look closely at it or really think about it, it occurs to you that it's nonsense. Now that principle, you know, take that principle and apply it to the entirety of the Christian narrative, and you're well on your way to becoming a radical critic. But it's also useful for the weird little moments and connections within the New Testament books themselves. We also focused a lot on the rapture passage and gave what I think is a more plausible locus for it. I, I won't say that it's absolutely watertight, but you know, like the great radical Hermann Dettering would say, it's a starting point for further discussion at least. I consider the first letter to the Thessalonians to be a product of the middle period of the Pauline church, written by at least two clerics in the first decade of the second century, one of whom either personally wrote or was heavily influenced by the second edition of the second letter to the Corinthians. Whenever we talk about any writing under the name of Paul, our mission is to demonstrate that the writings are late and fictional and are made up of several composite layers. 
In 1 Thessalonians, we don't really see too much tampering with the letter other than editorial comments here and there that eventually made their way into the text. It's a short letter that was developed for a specific purpose. Plus, it's rather boring and not very meaty, so to speak. So the editors didn't really want to mess with it like they did with 1 Corinthians, the Romans. Those letters probably had about six different stages of editing a piece. And we wanted to also show that the religion of Paul originated and developed separately from mainstream Christianity. It's confusing because they talk about the same deity, Christ Jesus. Now they talk about similar beliefs in resurrection, baptism, salvation. But there are key differences that show that these religions are entirely separate. You know, for one thing, the concept of repentance, which is so important to the mainstream Catholic Church in this period, the concept is completely absent in Paul's letters. It's not just the commonly talked about things like circumcision and salvation through faith that distinguish Paul's letters. Almost every element of the belief that we find here differs from the Christianity of Matthew or James or of the Clementine literature in some fundamental way. And 1 Thessalonians shows this. It's a document written by Jewish Gnostic clergy who are presiding over a largely ex-pagan congregation, writing theological comments to one another, almost like on a primitive message board about questions raised by earlier documents in their community. We continue with our New Testament journey, and we've gone through the first of 27 books. Someday we'll come back and do a close reading of 1 Thessalonians, God Help Us. And when we cover certain books on this show, it's not like that's the last time we can ever mention them. You know, we'll revisit them again and again as needed. At the end of our analysis here, can we say that there's any compelling reason to believe the traditional narrative about this book, that it's a loving letter written from the hands of Paul, sent to his dopey converts, reminding them about things that just happened two weeks ago, you know, and then he just happens to spout off about the rapture and then says that the end of the world is going to feel like your water breaking. I mean, first of all, did he just forget to cover this when he was preaching to them in the previous month? I think that every piece of evidence that is usually advanced to date this letter in the first century can be reversed right back at the apologist and used to date it in the second century. The passage about the rapture was the biggest obstacle we faced, but by reading it as the theological commentary that it is, we find that there's a reasonable alternate explanation for it that actually makes sense. That's the thing. The traditional Christian view just doesn't make sense. Like, why on earth? Would the congregation members not know a piece of information so basic? Why on earth would it not have been addressed on the spot? Why on earth would a writer have to speak ex cathedra in the person of the Lord to clarify the correct belief? Unless, of course, he's in fact making a comment or a gloss that he wants to be considered authoritative. We dispense with the notion that the document is early and following the Dutch radical school, in the name of St. Candida, we declare it to be late and spurious. I want to close with a statement from the New Testament commentary by the scholar Raymond Brown. He takes a conservative view, and he points out how interesting it is that here in the earliest Christian document, which he dates to 51 AD, that all of the major elements of Christianity appear to be in place. He says, Within the opening ten verses, one would hear references to God the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit, and to faith, love, and hope. That is a remarkable testimony to how quickly ideas that became standard in Christianity were already in place. But that fact is significant to him for a much different reason than why it's significant to us. This statement that all of these elements would already be present makes sense to us because we view the document as late. Thank you for listening. Join us next time. This criticism is ended. Go in peace. What are the stories of mythology? as historical reality. 